It's decided that a famous fishapod couldn't walk, Earth's magnetic field still can't be explained by evolution, and we dive into the mailbag with an extended play version. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, broadcasting this week from a top secret location in Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia, still on the run from the authorities trying to shut us down, we bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we'll give glory to the creator while doing it. Remember, you can find us at wazulu.com or genesisweek.com, and you can peruse other episodes conveniently using the links in the upper corners of each episode. You can also subscribe to this channel with the link right there. I'm your host, Ian Juby. In past episodes, we've gone over the wild story of land creature evolution. Now, as you all know, fish were supposed to have grown legs and walked up onto land, becoming tetrapods, four-legged animals like the amphibians. In fact, a very famous fishapod sequence has been developed over the years. Now, this past week, a report came out in Nature magazine detailing a skeletal structure of one of the famous fishapods, Ichthyostega. The study concluded that there was something fishy about Ichthyostega, A skeletal reconstruction and computer modeling suggested it could not walk around as was previously supposed. Ichthyostega was an evolutionary flop, literally. The researchers concluded that at best, Ichthyostega may have flopped around using its front flippers, much like a seal does on land, and that its back flippers probably didn't even lift its back end off the ground. But, as was pointed out in previous programs, we find fossil tetrapod footprints in rocks considerably older than any of the alleged tetrapod ancestors. Now, footprints from a tetrapod that had fully developed feet, toes, ankle bones, and limb bones you cannot be your grandfather's father. Therefore, this entire fishapod sequence is no longer valid. Another paper in Nature by Pazzo et al. discusses how, once again, we have insurmountable problems explaining the Earth's geomagnetic field within the paradigm of an Earth billions of years old. The researchers concluded that the Earth's core was much more electrically conductive than previously thought. The high conductivity produces problems for the conventional, naturalistic model of Earth's geomagnetic field. Writing about the Pazzo paper in an editorial commentary, Bruce Buffett wrote, it is remarkable that a modest change in thermal conductivity can have such a dramatic effect on the dynamics of Earth's core. More broadly, the latest study reveals how the properties of liquid iron make the operation of magnetic dynamos in terrestrial planets even more precarious than was pre previously believed. We are left with the challenge of understanding how Earth has succeeded in maintaining its magnetic field over most of geologic time. In other words, not only does the finding produce problems for the naturalistic origin of Earth's magnetic field over billions of years, it also calls into question the origin of all very old planetary magnetic fields. Interestingly, creation researcher Dr. Russell Humphreys produced a model explaining Earth's magnetic field, which was based on the creation account of the Bible and a 6,000-year-old solar system and universe. He extrapolated that model to other planets in our solar system and actually made numerous predictions way back in 1984. Now, this creation model not only explains Earth's rapidly weakening magnetic field, Humphrey's predictions for the magnetic fields of Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and Mercury, as well as the predictions for remnant magnetism on Mars, have all been proven correct. Now, while a the theory is strong because of its explanatory power, the true strength of a model lies in its predictive power. The evolutionary naturalistic theories of planetary magnetic fields have failed all explanations and all predictions. While the creation model, based on the biblical account of recent creation, has explained and predicted planetary magnetic fields. Now, if the Bible is correct about these things, what else is it correct about? Mail for me?
Let me forget. I'm supposed to cut the blue wire or the red wire? Or I could just pull the detonator. After much prayer and consultation with friends and you, the YouTube viewers, I have decided to take better control of what happens in the comments of my videos. Many of you viewers had complained about the trolls, and I also wound up spending considerable time addressing the comments left by trolls. Inadvertently, this caused me to miss the mark in reaching out to you, the reasonable intellectual viewers. For this, I apologize, and I will now heavily moderate comments and responses. This show is intended to be a professional reasoned critique, and I'm thus raising the bar of expectation for commenters. Comments that are off-topic, inflammatory, or are just deemed inappropriate in any way will be deleted. Repeat offenders will be banned. I welcome and invite serious and reasoned criticism, questions, and dialogue. On that note, Jason wrote in, how does YouTuber Paul Chartley come up with such slanderous imposition from watching one short video? Did Chartley let his imagination run wild? Jason was referring to Paul Chartley's video response to last week's special edition report on the Amazonian pictographs, which you can see by clicking the link for last week's episode in the upper left-hand corner. Now, because this program has higher standards than Paul Chartley apparently does, I don't think Chartley's video was even worthy of a response. After all, if he's using personal insults, then I can only conclude it is because he has nothing of any real value to say, and he knows it. This was pretty obvious with his outrageous and ignorant claims of fabricated evidence and fraud. In fact, I took one look at Nelson's video footage and I already knew what had happened because of my knowledge of cameras. The sun shield got turned on the camera. Now, this was obvious to anyone with any experience of cameras, of which apparently Charlie has none. And thus, Charlie resorted to outlandish accusations of hidden cameras? Charlie has discredited himself, and thus I will not be wasting my time responding to his utter nonsense, lest I get cut up and miss meeting you, the serious truth seekers. Speaking of which, while in Toronto, I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Mark, James, and Robert, as well as a bunch of other guys from the Toronto Truth Seekers. Robert sent in a question for one of his co-workers named Tom, asking, what about humans in the fossil record? Well, thanks for the question, Tom, and that is an excellent question I get all the time. Where are all the human fossils? Well, actually, there's lots and lots of them, but you never hear about them. Ironically, the very same people who so arrogantly tout that they have the fossils and therefore have one, are the very ones who withhold the human fossils that show that evolutionary theory does not stack up to the evidence. Now, I realize the vast majority of evolutionists do not fall into this category of people I would call anti-creationists. The vast majority of evolutionists are simply not aware of the copious numbers of human fossils. And here's why. Let's take a look at Artipithecus ramidus cadaba. When the first fossils were written back about back in 2001, Nature magazine published a photograph of all the bones found thus far. Time magazine focused on this toe bone, even boldly proclaiming in their article that... This toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Now, this is interesting for multiple reasons. This toe bone was found 16 kilometers away from the rest of the bones. Now, if you found a bone here and another bone 16 kilometers, 10 miles away, would you assume they were the same creature? Secondly, Dr. Ma Joseph Mastropolo compared this fossil toe bone with human, chimpanzee, and baboon toe bones and concluded the fossil toe bone was most similar to the human toe bone. In other words, it would appear that a human toe bone, found 16 kilometers away from the rest of the bones, was included with ape bones to make a genuine ape-human fossil. Genuine only because they mixed genuine human and genuine ape fossils together to make a fict fictitious chimera. A similar incident happened with the famous skeleton Lucy, where Donald Johansson first found a fossil knee found two and a half kilometers away from, and 70 meters deeper in the rock layers than the rest of the Lucy skeleton. Now, during the Nova PBS production on Lucy, anatomist Owen Lovejoy said, when Don brought the Hadar knee back from Ethiopia, he brought it over to my house and laid it out on the living room park carpet. And I knew instantly that was a human knee. It was clearly a human knee. But, as we all know, based on the alleged age of the rocks in which the fossil knee was found, humans had not yet evolved. We now have fossil evidence of humans appearing in rock layers that are wrong according to evolution. 
whatever to do with this. The researchers then went on the assumption that this knee must then belong to Lucy, a fossil skeleton that had all the hallmarks of a chimpanzee skeleton. They then interpreted a chimpanzee skeleton based upon a human knee. They even went so far as to take a Dremel to the fragments of Lucy's hips and modified it to make the hip look more human. They even admitted on film that they did this, and I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of the Nova production to see for yourself. So we have another case of ape and human fossils being put together, with the human fossils assumed to belong to an ape, and thus they are not reported as human fossils. But when a human fossil is found in the wrong place, according to evolutionary dogma, it is immediately discredited or swept under the rug. The human fossils are almost invariably in the wrong place in the rock record. For example, the fossil human finger, complete with soft tissue preserve, found in the walnut shale of Glen Rose, Texas. The walnut shale has fossil dinosaur tracks in it. Dinosaurs were supposed to have become extinct many tens of millions of years before humans evolved. The Calaveras skull, the ten completely modern human skeletons found in Cretaceous rocks near Moab, Utah, and many, many other out-of-place human fossils have been found over the centuries. In the basement of the British Museum of Natural History and a museum in Paris are stored at least six skeletons of completely modern human fossils, excavated from the island of Guadeloupe in the 1800s. The problem is that this rock is dated by the evolutionary timescale as Miocene or 28 million years old. At least one of those skeletons was on display for some 50 years in the British Museum, but with the advent of Darwinian evolution, the skeleton was then relegated to storage in the basement as this skeleton defies evolutionary interpretation. In a written response to questions about the Guadalupe woman fo fossil, Dr. Hilary Ketchum of the British Museum said, Paleontological and mineralogical work has been carried out on the block we have, which indicates nothing unusual about this find. There's nothing unusual about a completely modern fossil human skeleton in 28 million year old rock? Uh, uh, there most certainly is something unusual about that. It's unusual enough that several anti-creationists very loudly tried to explain it away by saying the dating of the fossil must be wrong. In response, geologist John Mackay went to the very excavation site on the island of Guadeloupe and verified that, yes, according to the conventional evolutionary geologic maps, that rock is 28 million years old. John then went to the British Museum to discuss his findings with Chris Stringer, Principal Scientific Officer at the British Museum. John asked Chris, how many human fossils do you know of? To which Stringer responded, oh, about 30,000. 30,000? How many of you viewers are aware of these fossil bones? None of you? Yeah, that's what I thought. And that is precisely why this program exists, to bring you the information others don't want you to hear. The fact of the matter is that there are tens of thousands of fossil human bones, the vast majority of which thoroughly refute evolution. These fossils affirm that humans have been around since the beginning of time, and that millions of years of Earth's history has been scientifically falsified. And thus countless numbers of honest, truth-seeking people are convinced that evolution must be true based on the fossils. Fossils which have either been misrepresented, misinterpreted, or never even reported. I hope that answers your question, Tom. Well, that's it for this week's show. Join me again next Genesis Week. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now and reminding you of the words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. See you next time as we search out the truth together. Production software was provided for Genesis Week by the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, located just 25 minutes north of Drumheller, Alberta. Visit bbcsm.com for more details. You can help keep this program going by making a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office, Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4.